Okay, so um, in the last lecture, we um, we looked at <coughs> we just set up the problem of how you define the axes of an embryo, and we defined several axes that that characterize the embryo. What I'm going to try and do today is uh, sort of give you the logic of how axis specification um, is achieved and how the regulatory mechanisms, gene regulatory mechanisms that underlie axis specification not only help confer cell fate, um, but also help direct the cell behavior that is necessary to sculpt tissues into their specific shapes. Yeah? Okay. So, Vijay already spoke to you in the last talk about, um, about the fact that the fruit fly embryo shows features of segmentation. And we both showed you movies where you can see this segmentation morphologically. Um, what this segmentation is also manifest in is patterns of expression of genes which show this stripy character. Yeah? And so that's one aspect. And this is a feature of uh, of the anterior posterior axis. In other words, these subdivisions happen along the anterior posterior axis. And Vijay already briefly mentioned to you that one way in which this sort of segmentation arises is through the action of gradient um, that have two distinct gradients that have their sources either at the anterior end or at the posterior end and are already present in the egg. In other words, they're present maternally uh, or they're deposited or there's information already present maternally that acts on gene regulation after after the embryo, after the egg has been laid and the embryo develops. So what I'm going to try and do is to take examples of how you can link gradients to conferring cell fate and how you can link these gradients to the direct, directing cell behavior that uh, helps sculpt the tissue. Okay, so what I thought I would do um, in the interest of time is focus on one, one axis rather than uh, do all axes. And I would just like to go back to show you this movie to say that when we look at gene expression patterns and we look at segmentation, we're looking at static images. But what you should remember is that development is a very um, dynamic process that involves large-scale tissue deformations. And one of the key things that needs to happen is that somehow information present in the genes must still be able to uh, convey that information in the face of large-scale tissue movements and tissue deformations. And what I'm going to show you is how gene expression patterns govern fate specification in tissue movements, but how tissue movements in turn regulate gene expression patterns, right? So that will allow us to see a chemical view of how you can specify fate and direct behavior, but also a mechanical view of how tissue deformation itself might feedback, regulate gene expression patterns. So um, 
Okay. So here's a sorry. So in that case, whatever needs a lighter They were what? Uh, in that video, there were brighter nuclei. Yeah. And those uh, belong to what? Bigger sorts? and brighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they are more so sparse. Those are from my favorite tissue. It's a tissue that's called the amniocerosa. They're polyploid in nature. And so the cells are larger, the nuclei are larger and brighter. I'll come back to it at some later point if time permits. But Okay, so here's what I was saying. So the embryo has an anterior-posterior axis along which it's subdivided into segments. Um, but the embryo also has a dorsoventral axis, this being dorsal and this being ventral. And if you look at the distribution of certain uh, proteins or gene products, you will see that they exhibit um, a skew in their spatial distribution. This green signal here, for instance, is primarily located in the anterior end of the embryo. This signal here is restricted to the two poles, anterior and posterior poles of the embryo. And this signal here is primarily restricted to the dorsal side of the embryo. And, and this information is present or is, is already present in this stage here, which is the Drosophila equivalent of the single cell. And I was telling you earlier today that this cell undergoes multiple rounds of nuclear divisions without cytokinesis to create a bag of cells uh, sorry, a bag that's filled with nuclei. And then the nuclei migrate to the periphery to form a sheet of cells. And then this sheet of cells begins to undergo um, um, the morphogenetic movements that I showed you in the movie before. So I focus today on on the dorsoventral patterning system and, and try and address how you uh, polarize the embryo along this axis. Um, yeah. You know, this large scale movement of cells uh, that we saw in the video. <clears throat> yeah, the large scale. The large. So, uh, this. Uh, Large, is it audible? Please? Yeah. Um, the large scale movement of cells and um, this, uh, gra you know, uh, setting up of this gradient. Uh, what is the time? Uh, uh, what? So you are saying that the gradient actually gradients are present even before that large scale movement of cells. Well, starting. before that. So, so actually, so. So I guess what I'm trying to say is these gradients are present very early on there and they generate outputs by way of defining domains of gene expression along each of those axes. I think what Vijay was, was sort of referring to when he was talking about gradients was these two gradients here, Bicoid and Nanos, that that allow you to uh, um, generate pattern along this anterior-posterior axis by regulating the expressions, by regulating or defining domains of gene expression along this axis. Yes, but if cells are going to migrate massively um, while these gradients are present, then an individual cell which has moved from this end to that end or, you know, it has gone around. You're basically asking the question of kind of like how a cell, <clears throat> uh, cell remembers its position 
in a gradient in the face of large scale movements. Is that sort of what well, you're actually, asking? I'm not quite clear uh, myself about the question. I'm just uh, 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 wondering that this is very complicated because uh, once the cells have occupied their final positions, if then there is a gradient, then you know you can talk about segmentation because each cell now sees a certain concentration uh, profile of each of those uh, chemicals that is involved and responds to that chemical profile, expresses different things depending upon that chemical profile and becomes, uh, you know, different. But if the cells, if this, uh, you know, gradients are present even before the cells have occupied their final positions, then, um, uh, so what is, I mean, uh, when is this patterning arising? This patterning okay, so is arising the after the are an early down, feature of embryogenesis, but you could say in some sense those gradients are quickly converted to more stable uh, spatio-temporally restricted gene expression patterns. So in a way, it's not as if the embryo throughout its lifetime is going to be seeing that bicoid, that gradient that say, had, had its source here and was decaying here like that. So there is an output that results from this gradient that subdivides or that becomes translated. And I, I think perhaps you will hear about it from Fernando. I'm not entirely sure. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that these these gradients have a certain uh, lifetime of existence and these gradients become translated like Vijay was showing um, to uh, broad uh, domains of stable gene expression that depend on some combinatorial uh, concentrations of, let's say, the two opposing gradients. Yes, but this is all presuming that the cells are stationary. Cells that, are? That the cells themselves have become stationary. Yes. Right? <clears throat> I mean, uh, you know, so if there is, if on a matrix of stationary cells, yeah. you have this pattern of, uh, you know, this uh, final pattern of, uh, of these chemicals, then, um, you know, uh, it's clear that different cells will have a different expression pattern. But um, if uh, this is going to happen um, before the cells have acquired their final positions, then this, you know, uh, the cell as it is moving across this whole region uh, will see different uh, uh, things. And uh, what I'm just wondering is whether, whether we are talking about the stage, you know, when we are talking about this pattern developing and resulting in segmentation, we are talking about the stage where the cells have already finished their gastrulation or whatever it is and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, already, you know, sort of come to be relatively fixed with respect to each other? Or uh, we are talking about a stage where that has not yet happened. Um, which stage are we talking about? So I will say the gene expression patterns suggestive of segmentation are there from very early on in, in development and they continue to, to be expressed in those domains even in the face of large-scale cell movements. Because... So I, think, I think if you just look at the picture there, so there is one big gradient. So in other words, beginning. I will actually show you from some of, some of our work where we've labeled, let's say, one particular kind of stripe that, that is consistent with one of these dark or light stripes. So you can, you can follow those stripes by tagging that protein to a fluorescent protein. From the beginning of time, till it goes through all of these movements. And I'll say broadly that you have those domains, that stripe pattern of expression that, that that's persistent throughout development. The shape of that domain will change as morphogenesis, as, as morphogenesis happens. Some things that look like, that become, that start from being linear might become U-shaped and then become linear again. But domains of gene expression
expression that are the result of the transduction of these initial gradients remain in the face of morphogenesis. And I'll try and argue that some of those gene expressions, some of those patterns of gene expression also dictate how the cells in that domain uh, behave yeah. during those morphogenetic What's movements. What's confusing me is that gene expression is happening inside cells. And these cells are moving. So, so, um, so how is it that uh, you know this pattern is uh, is, uh, is is retained then? Right. I mean that pattern ought to get also badly mixed up. The, the now I'm, this is becoming a, a Drosophila conversation. So, <laughs> so the uh, initially the, the the cells are not cells. There's only one cell and many nuclei, and these nuclei are not are not moving around. So they, they respect their uh, relative positions that they've established. So once they read the, the early maternal uh, 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 gradients, then they start responding. And that all happens before there are major uh, uh, tissue reorganizations. So then the cells will close. Uh, so around the nucleus, the nucleus will retain that information. And there are now mechanisms that will stabilize uh, the gene exp expression patterns. Besides. The fact that, that you've seen those tissues moving around are quite dramatically doesn't mean that cells individually move. That is, cells in Drosophila don't exchange neighbors that much. Right? So even though the, the cell is like, like having these one of these uh, 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 sheets of paper, you can decorate them with different colors. And then you start like pleating them. Neighbors will remain neighbors, right? So uh, this is what, what she was saying, that once you label one of these expression domains and follow uh, the domain, it becomes twisted and folded, but the cells remain compact. So basically, in, in summary, the early information happens when there is, there's only one cell, and the, then you have a true gradient, true chemical gradient. And then afterwards, uh, this interaction with the gradients, with the nuclei, will uh, trigger and, and she will explain that later on. And then cells become fixed in position and in fate. And then cell movements, uh, tissue movements or embryo movements won't change the relative relationships, at least dramatically, among the, the cells. Right? So, so position is determined very early on during development. And, and such is, is the, the, the thing that you, one can, at that very early stage, before any gas relation has happened, one can label uh, genetically different cells and will give you contiguous patches of tissue in the adult, for example. Telling you that these cells haven't moved, haven't moved around much. So the commitment has already happened. Yes. I mean, I still... Yeah, no, I think perhaps because we spoke about a, an early stage where we just had nuclei without cell membranes. Um, so, so you're probably talking about thinking about nuclear movement because I described the stage that I call syncytial, where you have nuclei without cell membranes, but as soon as they become confined by cell membranes, you just have this single sheet. And like he said, for all practical purposes, large groups of cells behave collectively. And in fact, one of the consequences of these gene expression patterns is actually to build boundaries that keep those cells intact. Okay, so um, I'm going to go from here to, um, to, to sort of talking about uh, this establishment of the dorsal ventral axis in Drosophila. And so here, rather than showing you the cylinders that make up the embryo, what we're going to do is to look at cross sections of this embryo. So as I said, this is dorsal, this is ventral, this is anterior, this is posterior. And so if I make this cross section, it will look like this, right? And here, this is dorsal, this is ventral. And in this panel here, you see that the nuclei of the cells are labeled in magenta, 
And you see that the nuclei are distributed uniformly around the circumference of this structure. Whereas if you look at the distribution of a protein that's called dorsal, you see that that protein is restricted to a subset of cells in the dorsal most region of the embryo, right? Uh, what you will also see is that this protein is present within the nucleus. Um, so, so you could say the embryo, one feature of polarization of the drosophila embryo along this dorsoventral axis is the formation of a nuclear gradient of dorsal, which is what you see here. Um, I was also telling you that that these gradients have an important role in conferring fate to the cells uh, of that sheet that surrounds this whole embryo. And so at, at, the, vent, at, the, at the sort of ventral region of the embryo, which is this part here, is where the cells that are fated to become the mesoderm form. Now, the dorsal most region here is where the cells that become the amniocerosa form. And he was just asking me about what those big bright cells were in that movie, and that's where these cells originate. And along this dorsoventral axis, you also define fields of cells that have specific fate. So the neurogenic ectoderm, forget about these terms, forms flanking the mesoderm, the lateral ectoderm forms further up dorsal and the dorsal ectoderm forms here. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the fact that you have these fates specified, you have spatially restricted gene expression patterns that you see along this axis. And so some genes like snail, I'm going to talk about snail in the coming slides, are restricted in their expression to the dorsal most region. Others are expressed more laterally and still others become expressed dorsally. So just like you saw the segmentation of the anterior posterior axis into stripes of gene expression, you can say that the dorsoventral axis <coughs> is also subdivided into res uh, spatially restricted patterns of gene expression that correlate with the specification of distinct cell fates along this axis. Um, and all of all of these expression patterns are defined by the nuclear gradient of, of dorsal, which is this protein here. And here in this panel, you can see that these genes are in fact expressed in nicely uh, defined subdomains along that axis. So, as has been done for a number of number of uh, molecules that that form gradients, one can begin to try and understand how you can generate these spatially regulated patterns of gene expression. And I'd like to point out to you here, as I've done already, that dorsal is a nuclear protein. So um, let's see what, how you build a gradient. Yeah. Um, so initially, there was this uh, circle. Yes. And then one location was picked out as being the center of the dorsal expression. Right? Uh, initially, there was a circle, uh, which was symmetrical. Uh, you know, all angles around the circle were the same. And then one location was picked where the dorsal uh, uh, was going to be um, uh, uh, sort of uh, be the center of the dorsal part, right? Where the dorsal uh, um, expression would have its peak. Now, how, how was that particular point chosen in the first place? 
So that's, that's sort of what I'm, I'm going to come to right now. So how do you build a dorsal nuclear gradient, right? So, so, so the problem, let's say the problem with dorsal is that it's a nuclear protein, unlike what uh, Vijay has been describing to you uh, in, the, um, in the last talk. We're not really thinking about diffusion here because this is a protein that's resident in the nucleus. So in order for us to generate a nuclear gradient, we need to sort of try and invoke something else that's translated into a nuclear gradient of this protein dorsal. And based on generates this nuclear gradient of dorsal is a signal signaling pathway that operates in this space between the plasma membrane of the embryo and the vitellin membrane. I told you in the last lecture that, that the drosophila embryo was covered by this vitellin membrane, and there's a space here that's called the perivitellin space, right? And so effectively, one of the things we, we do know that's responsible for this dorsal gradient is the fact that there is this, this gradient that's already present in the egg which is the distribution of a protein called pipe that helps transduce or transduce a signal whose output is now to generate this dorsal nuclear gradient. So in some ways, what we have to ask then is what is, what's happening, what, what are the, <coughs> sequence of events that allow you to generate this dorsal nuclear gradient. And as you can see here in this cartoon, you have dorsal that's in the nucleus, is identified by these solid circles, dorsally, whereas as you go more ventrally, there's no dorsal in the nucleus, but there's some dorsal in the cytoplasm. So, one thing, one thing that's different then is how much of dorsal is actually in the nucleus. Um, so there is actually a problem with how you define this dorsal gradient because there is, there is the expression pattern of a certain other molecule called pipe in the oocyte prior to the formation of the embryo, whose domains are much wider, almost twice as wide compared to the fraction of cells in which this dorsal gradient is really very strong. Yeah. That is laid out by the mother? It's already present in the mother, yeah. So in a way, one of the puzzles that has, has been, um, has been prevalent in the field is how a maternal gradient in a maternal asymmetry in pipe expression pattern actually becomes translated into a much narrower uh, distribution of nuclear dorsal. Um, and so, so in, in a way, what you could say is that the width of this domain and the width of the uh, highest intensity of nuclear dorsal don't correspond to each other. And so people have had to think of mechanisms by which you refine the boundaries of, of this dorsal gradient despite having a wider domain of an, of an earlier, earlier present gradient. So I need to tell you a little bit about what actually happens 
in this perivitelin space. And you have a signaling pathway in the perivitelin space that we call the tall signaling pathway. And the tall signaling pathway has a dorsal, I mean, is activated dorsally. But as I said, its, um, its boundaries are broader than the, the domain in which dorsal is expressed. And so one mechanism that's been thought to confine the domain of toll signaling to a narrower region um, has invoked uh, a mechanism that's called self-organized shuttling. So Vijay said in, um, in his earlier talk that, um, you know, depending on what gradient you look at and what the features of that gradient are, you might not be able to simply invoke something like diffusion and degradation to explain the profile of that gradient. You might also have to have or invoke in certain cases inhibitors that, that allow you to refine the boundaries of a, uh, of a, of a gradient to allow you to give sharp domains of uh, gene expression. Sometimes these inhibitors are present in the region adjacent to that, uh, to, the, to the expression domain of what you want to restrict. Sometimes they're present within the same domain. And so what people have suggested as a mechanism by which you can convert a wide, wider domain of pipe expression, which is responsible for this gradient, into a narrower gradient of toll activation, which is the receptor whose activation or bind upon being bound by ligand results in the translocation of dorsal to the nucleus, is that this narrowing, narrowing the domain of toll activation actually involves an inhibitor-mediated shuttling mechanism. And in this particular case, the inhibitor is not produced outside this domain, but it's actually produced within the same domain in which the ligand is produced. And somehow, dynamically, it's generated concomitantly with the ligand following its cleavage. So in other words, what people have suggested here is that for the dorsal, for the establishment of the dorsal gradient, there, is, there are inhibitors that are produced within the same domain of expression as pipe that function, con that sort of are um, generated along with the ligand at the time of its cleavage. And that in this particular case, um, you need to have this sort of mechanism of coordinating the generation of, of um, the ligand and this inhibitor within the same domain to narrow the region uh, along this axis in which uh, this pathway is active. And the toll pathway itself it's out, the output of the toll pathway is to translocate dorsal to the nucleus. So effectively, what's happening in the perivitelin space here then is that you have to generate a ligand by cleavage that can then go bind the receptor on the membrane here. And that internalization of that receptor ligand complex then allows the translocation of dorsal to the nucleus. But to confine the activation of this 
told to a narrower domain than defined by pipe expression domain. You need to invoke this mechanism of self-organized shuttling. Um, I think um, I think Tim Saunders will probably describe mechanisms of gradient formation in his talk, so I'm not not going to take you through it in any detail. But if we look at what the outcomes of this nuclear dorsal gradient uh, are, there are several outcomes. And you could say that it defines the domains in which several different signaling pathways become active. So for example, the TGF beta signaling pathway has its domain of expression here. The EGF receptor signaling pathway has its domain of activation here. The FGF signaling pathway has its domain of activation here. So what a gradient in the perivitelin space achieves then is the spatial restriction of activity of signaling pathways along this axis. What it also achieves is the regulation of cell behavior in distinct regions along this dorsoventral axis. So I'm going to focus on just the ventral most region um, which is highlighted here in red, which, which, which at the earliest stages is the region that expresses the highest nuclear gradients of dorsal. And those high uh, levels of dorsal nuclear gradient allow the transcription of two transcription factors, snail and twist. Now, I'm going to focus a little bit on snail and twist because these are transcription factors that if you go back to the, to the previous slide, um, help define, um, define the mesoderm. And the mesoderm in Drosophila is what becomes internalized to form a new germ layer during the process of gastrulation. So if I think of this band of cells on the ventral region of the embryo now, so if I were to turn this embryo so that it's looking ventral up, then essentially I have a band of cells in the ventral region of the embryo that becomes specified uh, as mesoderms through the activation of the tall pathway that results in a high dorsal nuclear gradient, resulting in the activation of two other transcription factors, twist and snail, whose expression is restricted to this domain. It is this domain of cells which um, which during the process of gastrulation actually goes from being on the surface of the embryo to the interior of the embryo in a process that you could either that's either been called gastrulation or ventral furrow formation right the red here marks twist expression, and the green just um, labels the membranes, right? Um, so what you will see is that in the cells that express twist, you have internalized this strip of cells and brought them to the inside of the embryo. And subsequently, what these cells will do is excuse me is to spread out a question yeah uh, how is that band restricted from the two how is how is that band uh, restricted 
from uh, expressing in the two uh, caps or the two edges. Sure. Yeah. Okay, I'll come to that. Actually, this is a little bit inaccurate. I will show you. I'll show you that there aren't gaps here like this. That's a good point. So, in principle. actually expressed like this so this and i'll i'll come to how how you might regulate expression of twist in these in these regions because there's an interesting interesting angle to that so you're right this this bit here is the misrepresentation okay so um what happens once these cells uh internalize is that initially they um, so if you think of what's happening to the, to the tissue as a whole, it's going from being like this to forming a small indentation here to deepening that indentation. And then at a subsequent stage, somewhat flattening that indentation. And then so sort of spreading along the surface of the ectoderm to then create a new layer of cells, right? So you could say that the consequence of this invagination is to convert this embryo from a, from a single a layered structure to creating a second layer that forms internal to this. So this process here is called ventral furrow invagination. And when we say invagination, we typically think of bending a sheet of cells. And what we will now try and ask is, The ventral furrow enhanced myosin expression in the in the so is it known that the myosin really is contractile and drives the yeah I I will I'll take you through that so so just to show you that if you look at the ventral surface of this embryo here at the end of this process this is what it will look like you've really created a furrow on the on the ventral surface. So these images are from Eric Wieschhaus's lab. And what I'm going to show you now is a movie from Adam Martin's lab that illustrates um, that illustrates something related to what Vijay was asking. So in red here, you see the cell outlines. And in green, you see, you see myosin as this process of imagination is happening. Just one second. So red shows you the outlines of the cells in the ventral region. And green shows you foci of myosin that are enriched just in the cells of this ventral domain, right? Vijay was, Vijay was asking, asking about where myosin is enriched. I'll come to that in just a little while. Um, OK. So what, 
mutational studies have shown us is if you take away um, dorsal or you take away two of its targets, twist and snail, not only do you not specify the mesoderm, but you also fail to create this mesodermal germ layer on the inside. So you could say that twist and snail are necessary to drive, to both specify the mesoderm and to drive its invagination. So these proteins, twist and snail, are also transcription factors. When, and we discussed what a transcription factor is. It's a protein that binds DNA and then regulates the expression, it regulates gene expression. So one question you can ask is, how, how does the elaboration of this dorsal nuclear gradient that translates to twist and snail expression actually facilitate the modification of behavior of the cells in this tribe such that that part of the sheet now invaginates. And as you will see here from a cartoon from Maria Leptin from many years ago, one of the things that, that's characteristic of each of these different stages is the shape of the cells within this domain. And what her lab showed many years ago was that at the end of gastrulation or ventral furrow invagination, this twist expression pattern that looked like this would sort of look like that once the invagination had happened, right? And in, in mutants or either single mutants or combinations of mutants of either one of these transcription factors, snail, um, along with other genes whose expression dependent, depended on twist, would result in the incomplete invagination of, of this, um, of this mesoderm primordium. So one of these targets does not really result in a drastic uh, failure to invaginate, but if you combine a mutation in that target with a reduction in the dose of this other transcription factor, you will see that invagination fails. One consequence of failed invagination is that you see that there isn't a uniform invagination uh, towards the interior. So if you look at the expression of this transcription factor twist, which is what I was telling him there, it also have some expression here on this side. If you look at the, just the brown color here, there's brown and blue, forget about the stripes. You'll see that you don't see a nice, uh, let's say, upper boundary of twist expression. You see that it's all kind of jagged. And if you turn the embryo up on the ventral side, you see that there are um, still some cells in the middle that haven't invaginated. And one consequence of this failure of invagination is that the embryo itself is kind of twisted. And it was really this, this sort of phenotype that gave the genes these names of twist and snail to imply that the, that the embryo itself is, is twisted, in addition to the fact that the mesoderm has not become internalized. So the next question you could, you could ask is, um, how might twist and snail govern mesoderm internalization? And as I showed you already in this movie, I think it's the same one, the other one's not playing, I'm not sure why. Um, you will see that in the cells in the mesoderm, myosin that's labeled 
in green forms these foci. We're now looking at the apical end of these cells. By the apical end, I mean the end that you can see here, right? So you're basically seeing foci of myosin that are concentrated within each of those cells. What became evident? Now, Vijay was asking whether you have myosin concentrations around the membranes and so on. What became evident in studies from Eric Wieshaus and Adam Martin was that in order for you to invaginate this band of cells, each of the cells in the mesoderm has to do what we call apical constriction. By that, I mean, if you think of a cell as being uh, cylindrical to begin with, um, you can say it has a top and a bottom. And so basically, if I want to bend the sheet, I need to be able to constrict the edges around here so that you have wedge-shaped cells, like you see here. Um, but unlike what, what uh, people have commonly believed as a way of generating apical constriction, which is to build actomyosin cables around these cells, like you might see here, what Eric Wieshaus and Adam Martin found was that on the apical surface, so the constricting surface of these cells, myosin was not, was primarily found not close to the membrane, but somewhere in a region that we'd call medioapical, meaning that it wasn't close to the junctions of the cells, but it was internal to, to the junctions. And so this red thing is myosin, this is actin. And so essentially what you can see is that you have some sort of disordered, I won't say disordered, not you know, perfectly ordered organization of actin and myosin in the medial region of the apical, at the apical end of these invaginating cells. What, what they also showed was that these cells don't reduce their apical area like this, as in become progressively smaller and smaller, right? So if you plotted the area as a function of time, this area wasn't sort of decreasing like this, but rather what they found was that it would decrease, then there would be a stabilization, decrease, stabilization, decrease, stabilization, so on. So in a way, what they showed was that there was uh, some pulsatility in this constriction that was characterized by a phase where you saw a reduction in the apical area and a phase where you stabilized that reduced area by increasing the connectivity of those actomyosin networks to the membrane. And what they found was that if you looked at these two proteins, transcription factors, twist and snail, in particular, if you took away either twist or snail from, from the mesoderm of these embryos, they found that the consequences on this pattern cell shape change were different in a way that suggested that snail was required for this contraction of the cells. By that I mean this step here. And twist was actually required for the stabilization phase, which is this step here. So we're essentially talking about two transcription factors, which when removed have distinct effects on cell shape in this invaginating mesoderm. 
And so um, <clears throat> this sort of allowed us to think of twist and snail as transcription factors that not only govern the specification of uh, the mesoderm, but also provide instructions for how cell shape change needs to happen in order to be able to invaginate it, right? So during the ventral furrow, are the cells intercalating? Say again? Are the cells intercalating during the furrow? No, they're not intercalating. I will, I will, um, I'll, I'll come to that in tomorrow's talk. They're not intercalating, they're just, they're just undergoing this sort of stepwise reduction in area, meaning that it's not a continuous linear decrease in area, but there are pauses when the area does not change before the next step of constriction happens. So if you remember some of what we've looked at in at the other end of the embryo where you have the amniocerosa where which also um, exhibits apical constriction, there you have a different pattern, which is, which is of constriction and relaxation with very little uh, net reduction in area in this, in a certain part of this process, followed by a dampening of those oscillations to result in a more continuous reduction in area. So what sets the time scale for this ratcheting? It's really the pulsatile uh, myosin. So the time scale of each of these cycles is of the order of a minute or so. Okay, so, uh, so going back to where we were yesterday in which we were looking at the links between adhesion and the cytoskeleton. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, um, to try and explain how, what a transcription factor, or what kind of information a transcription factor, that's an output of this dorsal nuclear gradient, might do to influence cell behavior, we've to uh, uh, pathways to sort of, um, that help explain this cell shape change. The first is that one of these targets of twist uh, is a protein called folded gastrulation, which acts as a ligand for a receptor on the membrane that belongs to the family of G protein coupled receptors. And the binding of this ligand to the receptor activates actomyosin contractility by activating the rho GTPase pathway that we discussed earlier on. So at least one thing that TWIST does um, is to provide a ligand that can activate this G protein coupled receptor signaling. I showed you in the context of cell migration how a chemoattractant Q that binds to a G protein coupled receptor can lead to the dissociation of some subunits that are bound to that receptor to on the one hand activate Rho and the other hand activate RAC and then the mutual inhibition of the two allows you to create a front end and a back end. So at least one output of this pathway is to activate Rho. Um, and that is primarily the effect of twist. If we look at what, what else twist might be doing, I'd like to point out that although twist and snail are both uh, both targets of this uh, protein dorsal, I mean, of this transcription factor dorsal, uh, 
Snail itself depends on twist for the full extent of its expression. So you can think of it as a target of twist also. And one of the consequences or one of the effects of snail is to actually help disassemble cell junctions. Whereas twist, on the other hand, facilitates the reassembly of junctions and promotes constriction. So, and snail does this by down-regulating or repressing the uh, expression of cell-cell adhesion proteins like E. cadherin. So, you could say that twist and snail also have distinct effects on the adhesion and contractile apparatus within these mesodermal cells. Um, what also seems to be dependent on twist is the ability to, um, is, is, is that the production of fog by twist and its engagement with the G protein coupled receptors might actually help, help organize the microtubule meshwork in these cells in a way that can now concentrate the activators of this rho GTPase to the constricting apical end of the cell. So you could say that twist and snail influence both actomyosin-based contractility, junction remodeling, and potentially also microtubule organization that directs the delivery of regulators of contractility. So in some sense, this provides a way of thinking about how a maternal gradient that's translated into a dorsal nuclear gradient then allows you to accomplish changes in cell behavior that are required for the tissue dynamics, which is uh, invagination. So rather than have, so as far as how you can invaginate this sheet of cells is concerned, rather than have a mechanism that operates like a purse string in which you assemble actomyosin cables on the underside of the apical membrane at the, at the cell cell adhesion sites that then constricts the cell. You have a mechanism that, that operates more like a ratchet to allow you to generate constriction, but then also stabilize it. Um, and as you saw in that movie, apical constriction in this, this case is associated with bursts of myosin coalescence. Um, <clears throat> they increase in intensity and move together in the plane of the cortex to form large intense myosin structures in the middle of the apical cortex. And this is also associated with contraction of the actin meshwork. And it's accompanied by the invert folding of the cell surface at these E. cadherin spots. And this suggests that the meshwork contraction in the middle of the apical cortex pulls the cell surface at discrete junction attachment sites. And I told you earlier on depend, that depending on whether you have continuous adhesion or spot-like adhesions on the membrane, you can generate Act in actomyosin configurations that either form continuous cables or link up discrete spots on the membrane. Okay. So another aspect of what I'd like to talk about is uh, Maitri, one something. question. Yeah. So do we know what happens if uh, this ratcheting doesn't happen? Or if we inhibit the ratchet, ratcheting, but make it go sort of linearly down. Say again? So do we know what happens uh, if we don't allow for ratcheting to occur? We have 
if we don't allow for the ratcheting to occur when we don't allow imagination to happen ratcheting so huh. this sort of pulsating that you were saying okay so so in some sense i think um we will look at look at uh, so in tomorrow's talk we will look at two different uh, tissue morphogenetic events that both require apical constriction so one of them is this the other's dorsal closure and what i will do is describe similarities and differences between the two from the point of view of the fact that in one case you don't generate invagination but you generate a lot of contraction of the tissue both both require complex actomyosin meshworks that are medial rather than circumferential and we will discuss both at the level of individual cells but also at the level of the tissue which at at the boundaries of which you create an actomyosin cable what what the differences in the cable like organization you see at the boundaries is relative to the to the medial complexes that you see inside the cell so i will discuss this ratchet based mechanism both at the level of single cells and at the level of the tissue as a whole yeah maitri uh, yeah i have a question so in most of the uh, this videos they have tagged non muscle myosin 2 or myosins they and you talked about uh, activation of myosins so these are is this whichever they have tagged with gfp are the activated myosins or they are the total myosins what i showed you here yeah so what you've just you're visualizing here is simply the regulatory light chain of myosin tagged to gfp the regulatory light chain of myosin is what is phosphorylated on one or two residues to accomplish activation we do not have a live readout for myosin activation the only ways in which activation of myosin has been assessed in these systems is by using antibodies that are specific to the mono or diphosphorylated uh forms or residues that get phosphorylated so we don't have a real time readout um but we do have readouts from fixed preparations of myosin activity and there are also experiments where people have looked at mutant forms of this regulatory light chain in which you've either made the two residues non phosphorylatable or rendered them constitutively uh phosphorylated and then expressed these in the embryo and examined what the consequences of having of taking away activity or activating them is so uh in the fixed preparations also the activated myosins are also present in the middle of the cell or they are also present at the cortex of the cell where where is the activity so there is clearly activity in these medio apical foci but there is also activity in the circum apical region so you could say that both during dorsal closure and in ventral furrow formation there is a spatio temporal regulation of myosin activity in the medial region and in the circum apical region so if i had to give you an example from dorsal closure which i will discuss tomorrow you will see that early in the process much of the active myosin is medial right as you go to the second phase of dorsal closure where you've dampened pulsatility but more uh, or net more net constriction you will see that there is more phosphorylated myosin light chain at the junctions but the activators for that rock rock or row they are present at membranes 
So how uh, the activators present at membranes like Rho, GTPase <coughs> or Rho is actually uh, affecting the phosphorylating myosins in the mid apical. So your question is how? So the activators are at the membranes near the membranes row active row they are near the membranes so so so, so again i'll again take you through um, comparisons and contrasts between two different modes of apical constriction and i will say that it's fair to say that in the ventral furrow if you look at biosensors for row activity you see them active both in the medial region and in the circumapical region Right, But if you look at the effectors of Rho that are present in the two regions, they are different. So rock is actually present in the pulsatile medial pool to a, in a more enriched, uh, it's more enriched in the medial pool, whereas diaphanous, which is another effector of the Rho GTPase is more enriched in the circumapical pool, but Rho itself is active in both these places. But by mechanisms that we still don't understand, the effectors that, that operate in these two locations are differentially enriched. We still don't completely understand how, how this happens. But rock, like myosin, also exhibits uh, coalescence and pulsatility. And if there is time, I will show you some of that in compare and contrast what happens in the amniocerosa and in mesoderm invagination tomorrow. Yeah, a question? Okay. Uh, uh, you know, in this set of pictures that you've shown here, um, you've now given us the uh, sort of mechanisms for the invagination to start because uh, this twist and snail uh, they cause uh, internal changes of uh, myosin concentration and so on, and that causes the shell, cell shape to change. And now the invagination starts. So the first question is that in order for us, us to have that whole sequence of things in which uh, the invagination goes in, becomes larger, then it spreads out, you know, sort of uh, along the surface, and then, uh, you know, goes in this direction, is all that explained by just this? Or there are further downstream things that have there are further downstream things and further hmm. further proteins that I need to add to the picture, including some some that were mentioned there. I didn't I didn't mention them just because there'd be too many names. But but for example, this whole spreading of the mesoderm has its own its own program, and that's actually cell migration, if you want to think of it like this. Except that it's not the kind of migration that I spoke about with respect to the neutrophils or the macrophages, but, but it is migration nonetheless. And there is, so there are, so all I've focused on in what I've just told you is this part here. So from, to go from here to here to here require a whole host of other cell behaviors and other gene functions that I've not elaborated. Fair enough, but it's sort of, uh, we can presume that uh, it is downstream of this twist and snail and once they are activated, then that activates the program for doing the next thing and so on until that Okay, happens. so you can think of it in two ways. You can think of, think of a hierarchy in uh, gene regulation, but you can also think of some sort of contingency on, on an earlier occurring morphogenetic movement for the next one to happen. So, in other words, if I need to be able to invaginate the mesoderm before it can spread, so if I don't invaginate it, I won't, I also won't be able to, to spread it. But it's also possible, as I will show you, that mechanical inputs from earlier processes that deform the tissue could also uh, be ways by which you activate um, gene expression programs. 
So I guess the answer to your question, so you're kind of asking whether it's like a cannonball effect, as long as I kickstart the process, everything will sort of follow suit, one thing leading to the other leading to the other, versus um, you have multiple independent right. ways of doing that. So it's fair to say that twist and snail govern all aspects of morphogenesis in the mesoderm. But if I look downstream of twist and snail, I can say that some targets of twist are required for internalization, but not the spreading, and other targets of twist are required for spreading, but not internalization. So it diverges downstream of twist. And the second question was that from this picture, it appears that the um, cell uh, sort of, if, if this is your um, uh, posterior, anterior posterior axis, and this is your, um, uh, you know, also, uh, uh, you know, sort of ventral here and dorsal here. Then um, the coordinate of a cell, its location in the anterior posterior direction does not change. It's moving in this direction, right? As it is spreading, as, as it is spreading upwards, uh, it's spreading in this direction without changing its location uh, in this direction. And thereby, it continues to see the same gradient of uh, those bicoid and other things that uh, um, so, is there in that direction. Yeah, so I will say in this, um, OK, so again, it, if you look at the time in embryogenesis when, the, when, when this invagination is happening, it really much of the morphogenetic movements that are happening I'll show you an example. So, so, so you could say the largest scale movement that's happening at this stage is getting this thing in. But what's also happening fairly concomitantly towards the end of this process. So there's also tissue deformation that's happening because of another invagination that happens here, right? And if you look much later on, there's large scale displacement of cells along this axis to the extent that what was posterior and located here will now shift its location and be positioned there. So in other words, this strip that had this shape will have to take the shape of a U. This means that you've, in terms of where you are anteriorly and posteriorly, something that was initially posterior is now physically located ventrally and anteriorly, right? But if I look at gene expression patterns in this part and say, I had colored gene expression patterns that um, represented some anterior posterior pattern, I would still see that these cells here continue to express whatever genes they were expressing when they were here. But the deformation has now completely displaced them. Of course, it will go back and correct itself in another process that follows that moves this whole thing back to its original place. But I'm saying these are large scale uh, displacements that happen. And dur by, during the time that these displacements happen, these gene expression patterns have already become stable. And are not, the cells are not really dependent anymore on the on the gradients that performed much earlier on. Of course, there is still lots of questions about what happens when cells divide within these regions. How do they maintain their positions and their gene expression patterns when they divide and so on. OK, someone earlier on asked me or pointed out to how you generate, ask me how you generate these gaps. And so 
the actual fact of the matter is that there isn't a gap. And if you look at twist expression in the embryo, it actually goes up to this little point here, right? To somewhere, somewhere here. And <clears throat> um, I'll be done after this. And what, what people did show was that although this part of the domain of twist expression requires high dorsal nuclear concentrations, these extensions of twist expression into the anterior and posterior uh, regions are not dependent on dorsal, but they can be affected by in mutants in which, for example, the opposing gradients from the two poles are perturbed. So in these mutants, the twist expression domain is a little bit like what I showed you here, meaning that it fails to extend onto these sides here. What, what was interesting was that people showed that these patterns of gene expression that normally require these anterior posterior, uh, high anterior posterior gradients for their expression, could nonetheless be reinstated in embryos in which those gradients were affected. If you simply exerted a mechanical uh, force on this anterior region of the embryo. So just by bringing a pipette in contact with this anterior end of the embryo, people were able to show that you could now reinstate this extension of twist expression in the anterior region. So in a way, what this allows you to see is that although this domain of twist expression depends on a set of other transcription factors besides dorsal, in their absence, you can simply by providing a mechanical stimulus, restore that gene expression pattern. This tells you that you can actually mechanically induce the expression of this transcription factor twist. And what that allows me to do is to provide you with the, uh, with the first example of what mechanical stimuli can do to morphogenetic processes. And all I'm, go I'm going to stop here to say that mechanical stimuli can induce gene expression. And it's possible that in the, during normal development, tissue deformations that happen, let's say, that, that normally occurring tissue deformations might in fact serve as a trigger for gene expression patterns. So I just want to leave you with the thought that we will elaborate on uh, in the next, next lecture that mechanical cues that are either extraneously provided as by poking a pipette on an embryo or that result from other tissue deformations that are occurring in the embryo can act as inducers of gene expression. So I think for most part in tomorrow's class, I'm going to take a bunch of different kinds of tissue dynamics and try and correlate what we can explain chemically, what, what depends on mechanochemical feedback. And I will take different cell behaviors, including similar cell behaviors in different tissues, and try and correlate how cytoskeleton and adhesion <coughs> organization uh, govern the cell and tissue behaviors you see, right? Both at the level of gene expression, protein distribution, and so on. And what I will, how I'll try and organize it is, 
I think I said in the first lecture that Stuart Newman said there were some conserved, conserved motifs that were used during the development of most organisms. And I will try and take three examples. One is apical constriction, the second is cell intercalation, and the third is collective cell migration rather than single cell migration. And try and see um, if we can synthesize uh, downstream effects that govern cell behavior, upstream chemical or molecular cues that regulate it and mechanical cues that influence it so that we can get a sense of what kind of control happens top down and what kind of control happens bottom up. 